Fritz and I first went east. We were only looking for a little adventure. Well, we certainly found it, and a good deal more. You see, we hadn't planned on sailing with pirates. But our first shock was Singapore. That was 1972, the year the tourist board was selling Singapore as Instant Asia. And you could never be quite sure if your door would be opened by the Maharaja of Jaipoda or Genghis Khan. I'd thought we'd left all this behind. I'm Lorn, the bearded one. Two years with the television network had convinced me that by temperament I was totally unemployable. And Lawrence, who's three years older than me, had just become a doctor. Not of medicine, I'm afraid, but of philosophy. And Singapore wasn't quite the mysterious East he was after either. Then, unexpectedly, we found an old book that would change everything. The Malay Archipelago, Land of the Orangutan and the Bird of Paradise by Alfred Russell Wallace, the 19th century naturalist and explorer who, quite independently of Charles Darwin, evolved the theory of natural selection and sent Darwin his findings before the origin of species was written. Wallace made his discoveries in the islands east of Singapore. In the 1850s, he was travelling alone for eight years through the world's largest and least explored archipelago. Wider than the continental United States, the 13,000 islands of what is now the Republic of Indonesia range from Sumatra to New Guinea. These were the spice islands of history, but today they're as forgotten as is Wallace's genius. His most ambitious voyage began a thousand miles east of Singapore in Old Makassar. The place seemed hardly to have changed since Wallace's day, except that Westerners were even rarer now than they had been then. Here in the Old East, that we decided to take ourselves and our camera in Wallace's footsteps. So we headed down to the docks, for that was where we might find the men who could make this possible. They were the romantic villains of Joseph Conrad's books, and we found that beyond the rusting tramp steamers of encroaching civilization, they still ply their trade today. The Gypsy Pirates. The boogies. East on the west monsoon and west on the east, their black-sailed fleets so terrified the early European spice traders that the word boogeyman entered our language. Once the exotic masters of these eastern seas, not much is known about them today, except that they're still pirates or traders or both. Here, spices, mother of pearl and rattan, are exchanged for exotic packaged goods from the Western world. It was from this harbour, 135 years ago, that Wallace had set sail on a boogie's prow like this. He was following their traditional monsoon trading route. 
From Makassar, 1,500 miles, out through the Spice Islands, across the Banda Sea, to become the first Westerner ever to see the greater bird of paradise, alive and dancing in its natural habitat, the Aru Islands. We were hoping that a voyage like his was still possible. So for weeks we scoured the docks, looking for a prow sailing east. But we were told they no longer go that far, and the boogies were none too helpful. They were not impressed by our stumbling attempts to learn the language. And during this time we saw three knife fights. One of them was fatal. We were beginning to have second thoughts about sailing with these characters. Until we saw the magic word, Dobu. The only harbour in the Aru Islands. A hundred tonner was loading up for the eastern voyage. Chairs and mattresses for the Chinese traders. Spare equipment for the pearl divers. And rough salt to cure the venison that abounds in Aru. She seemed to be all holed, with only one tiny cabin aft, where we found the captain, Tandri Dewa. He couldn't believe we wanted to sail on a boogie's prow. But realizing we're serious, he became suspicious that we'd been sent to spy on their activities. After days of negotiation, he agreed to take us only as far as their home base, on the other side of the island where the owner of the prow would decide whether or not we could accompany her all the way east. sign was when our toothbrushes were added to the privileged rack on the mast and we were allowed to take over the only cabin. Sir, this is to be our home for the next few months. Not much room in here, you can't quite sit upright and now that we've got all our equipment in, it leaves about enough room for us as you'd get in a rather cramped coffin. We've managed to make it reasonably cosy up here we have our rather meagre library and our charts. Here on the radio we can always pick up what's been happening with the statesmen of the great nations and how their social life is going. Our youngest shipmates were eight and ten years old and before this voyage they'd never seen cars, nor ice, nor electric light. Sinar Surya means sun shaft. Powered by the winds alone, she's a hundred foot mixture between the European spice traders and the original island craft. She carries two steering oars, extending deeper than the hull and serving as both rudders and keel. The spars take some eccentric twists, displaying their jungle origins, and her teak decks are corked with the bark of the sugar palm. With her fittings of woven rattan and ropes of coconut husk, she's a very organic creature. Comparing his prow with a luxury steamer of the day, Wallace wrote, how sweet was everything on board, no paint, no tar, nor grease nor oil, but bamboo and pure jungle fibers, which smell pleasantly, if at all, 
and recall quiet scenes in the green and shady forest. The word for crew member, Anak Prao, means child of the Prao. We heard no orders given. They worked as and when the mood struck them, but always responded quickly to the ship's unspoken needs. There were 16 of them, living in carefree intimacy, grooming each other for lice and fleas. They slept in huddles on the deck or strewn across the cargo in the hold. They seemed free of our western hunger for privacy, which had driven us to take over Captain Tundry's cabin. But even here there was no escaping their curiosity. Nor did we have the cabin entirely to ourselves, as Lawrence explains. There's a very wide variety of wildlife in here. There are at least five varieties of ants, uh, many creatures which are unidentifiable, all of them seeming to bite. Uh, there are bed bugs under here, there are gnats. But the, the most uh, active of the creatures are the cockroaches, which at night come out in vast hordes and run over us, and it sounds in this cabin here rather as if somebody's perpetually crumpling newspaper. This is one of the little deers here that has been got in the daytime for a change. But the most annoying, or rather the most alarming of all the noises, is this beam here, when there's any sort of a seaway at all, gives many inches to the left and to the right, and we can feel the whole boat shaking, all the timbers pulling apart, one direction and the other, but somehow it seems to stay together. But instead of the constant rhythm of an engine powering us along, it was the rhythm of the hand pumps just to keep us afloat. The mainmast, like much of the ship, was heavily eaten by rot. And our supposedly fresh water jars were fascinating windows onto the beginnings of all life. Ground corn was breakfast, lunch and dinner, boiled over a wood fire in a box on deck and Amir and Mansour turned out to be our ship's cooks. They were also the ship's barbers, and Captain Tandry got his weekly beard plucking, hair by hair. Their work seemed never-ending, but they lived a real adventure. On the third evening, we approached the islands of Tanakeki Point, still known as a place for pirate ambush. One of our anchormen, Tasman, brooded all night with his 12-inch parang at his feet. He told us that only three years earlier, his uncle and entire crew had been murdered here by rival boogies for their cargo. But safely past Tanakeki, it's a clear run to the tip of Celebes. Hidden behind it lies Bira, birthplace of our prow. But first we must negotiate the cape. Most sailors give its currents and riptides a wide berth, but the sailors of Bira pride themselves on cutting it very fine.
Once around the point, sheltered from the west monsoon, we're in another world. For nine months in the year, the beaches of Bira are empty. But early in the west monsoon, the boats return for repairs. The crews reunite with their families, exchange their yarns, inspect last year's harvest of babies, and sire the next. The homecoming prows bring gifts of unknown things. The Sinar Surya's trophies included two strange visitors, the likes of which hadn't been seen on these beaches since another Englishman, apparently, had lived here in the 1930s. This man tells us that he's still fondly remembered, though at the time, he was younger than this boy. Perhaps because of that mysterious traveller, we were received with unexpected kindness. <laughs> which was lucky, because many weeks were to pass before we'd actually leave Bira. First step was to track down the crime, the village chieftain who owned the prow and whose permission we needed to continue east. His household said he was away for a few days, settling a feud in another village. But we were made welcome, and that night we were invited to a boogie's wedding. With the fleet only in for three months a year, they've got to move fast on their courting and marrying. Most of these bridesmaids will get hitched by the time we've left. The fake glasses help a boogie's bride look fashionably glum on the day she finally escapes her father, only to become the property of her husband. The limp handshake is deceptive, because for those nine months of the year that the fleet's away, the women rule the roost. Halfway between men and women are the bisous. They are the transvestite priests of the old religion. <laughs> They're also seen as being halfway between the spiritual and the material worlds. Their presence at weddings ensures fertility. The boogies are supposed to be Muslims, but something much older was going on here. The mosque had its Islamic star and crescent moon all right, but everything else displayed an animist symbol of power, which was always winged. It's those ancient forces which govern the building of prows. Not a timber can be used which hasn't been first released from the forest with the permission of the jungle spirits. The axe is a luxury, the only tools they really do need from the outside world are the parang and the hand drill, with which they can make all the other tools they require. So from the parang and the drill springs this. Wooden pegs hold the prows together, 
Once they're immersed in the sea, they will swell to secure the timbers. They're not built from any drawn plans, but from the image in the shipwright's mind, so every one of them's different. Everything they make seems to have its own individuality, like this spear gun, powered by strips of inner tube and with a stock and trigger system rather like an old blunderbuss. And everyone had their own goggles, carved from wood, with bottle glass glued with resin as windows onto the underwater world. Eventually, the crying, the owner of the Sinarsuria turned up. He apologized he'd been delayed, sorting out a small matter of a murder in the village across the bay. He wasn't encouraging about our plans to sail east. He couldn't vouch for the safety of the ship nor the best intentions of the crew. He just wanted to take us on endless excursions. We were dying to get a yes or no answer about our voyage east, but he was more interested in pointing out the local sites giant fossilized clams in the cliff faces and orchids the rarest of which he said were in the aromatic gardens which seemed to float beyond man's reach to get our answer we could only surrender to the rhythms of an earlier time and wait By the third month, all the prows were on the point of departure. And it was only then that the crying finally granted us permission. He amazed me by giving Lorne an 18th century family heirloom, a magical mariner's dagger with a sea serpent pommel. I was to become absurdly superstitious about my boogie's dagger. And it's traveled with me ever since. The crying's wife gave Lawrence a delicately crafted model of the Sinarsuria. She insisted that it too had supernatural powers. And as long as it held together, so would the Sinarsuria. Captain Tandri had talked of replacing the rotten mast in Bira, but apparently the forest gods hadn't been forthcoming, because the same groaning timber was raised again. Before she could sail, a sacrifice. A goat, black for the strength and stability of Earth. To ensure a safe voyage, its blood must be spilled in the ship's hold. The next day, we were ready to sail, and the women brought a special farewell feast, your actual goat's head soup. Yeah. 
We made the most of it, because from here on in, it would be Amir and Mansour's corn gruel. Lawrence seemed happy enough to get moving again. But I couldn't help feeling a little nervous. It was, in fact, the last time we were ever to see our generous host, the crying. Returning to Bira seven years later, his widow would tell us he'd been hacked to death by one of his own people. It'll be nine months before the fleet returns to Bira, and nine months without rain. The women must defend their young from disease and starvation. An enforced matriarchy in a land too harsh to feed children and husbands through the dry months. The men face less predictable dangers. Of the 90 prows that left Bira last year, five never returned. This year, the Sinar Surya is the only prow making the eastern voyage, and nobody aboard has ever been that way before. Soon, the rest of the fleet peels southwards to pursue the more familiar trading routes to Java and Sumatra. By dusk, we're alone, heading into the unknown. Next morning, we had new company, After weeks, Navigation was a community affair, with everyone contributing his opinion. Once the great natural navigators, the boogies were guided by the clues in seaweed and bird droppings. But no longer. They now had a compass so clouded with age that its rose was barely visible, and one old chart on such a small scale that many of the islands in our path didn't even figure. So we had to rely on their sharp eyes and their instincts. But Captain Tundry had already realized that he'd made a bad mistake. Our rotten mainmast could become a dangerous liability. So in search of a replacement, he decided to put in to the isolated Sultanate of Bhutan. We anchored beneath the cannons of a ruined fortress. We thought we'd stumbled into a ceremony. But all this turned out to be just for our benefit. Apparently, we were only the fifth and sixth Westerners to get here since the last World War. And they wanted to take a good look at what the boogies had brought in. The flag dance of the palace guard recalls their first European visitors, Portuguese explorers. Their costumes reflect centuries of brief encounters with the West, from 16th century ruffles down to 20th century sneakers. Celebrations went on for days.
The Sultan's bodyguards told us that their traditional enemies were the pirate ancestors of the very boogies we'd arrived with. Each year, the West Monsoon would bring an invasion fleet from Makassar, as mighty as any European armada. No sooner had they been fought off than the East Monsoon brought a fresh invasion from the kingdoms of the Moluccas. So the Bhutanese built five miles of ramparts, which have helped keep their island in isolation down to the present day. The rare Celebes ape. An endangered species on mainland Celebes, they still rule the hills of Bhutan. They're respected for their uncanny intelligence, and the people here treat them as they would a neighboring tribe. They tell of how the apes carry their dead for burial into a cave deep beneath this tree. The only people who would take us inside were the professional python hunters. <laughs> This is also the burial place of the village's pre-Islamic ancestors. The chief hunter, Pak Abu, points out the track of a large python, perhaps the one that took a goat from the village the other night. They also had stories of people being eaten by the pythons, some of which they said can reach over 25 feet. To me, it felt rather like going down the throat of a python. The hunters didn't like it either but they can get a handsome price for the snake's skins from the Chinese traders on the mainland. But they must deliver them alive. Their only weapons are a lamp and a sack and their bare hands. <laughs> This one, he said, was only a baby, only nine feet long. <laughs> Back at the palace, the Sultan threw a farewell feast for us. This was an occasion which seemed to justify entrusting our camera to a bystander. The chief court official wears a unique symbol of his office. A helmet copied from that of a 16th century Portuguese captain and made of silver from their local mines. It's decorated with the golden plumes of the greater bird of paradise. Trophies from the distant Aru Islands. Aru. It was time to move on. We'd expected to head east with the west monsoon, straight for the Spice Islands. But Captain Tandri chose the longer route through the protected narrows of the Bhutan Straits. He'd failed to find a new mast in Bhutan and was frightened of facing the open sea with the old one. So we spent a wet and windless week going nowhere.
Even paddled outriggers left us standing. The bird, perhaps as disoriented as ourselves, seemed unaware of the perils of alighting so trustingly on a boogie's prow. We spent hours in our dripping cabin, reading Wallace and his account of the bird we were after. The birds of paradise, he wrote, gather for dancing parties in certain forest trees. When seen thus, it must be ranked as one of the most wonderful of all living things. But at this rate, we'd never reach Aru in time for the birds' short mating season. And where were the west winds? Then, Lawrence came up with something. This is going to sound ridiculous, but I had a dream last night that the reason that the winds weren't coming was because I'd turned the boat round facing backwards. And that if I turned it round facing forward, the winds would be right. This was the model of the Sinar Surya, my gift from the crying's wife in Bira. There didn't seem much else to do, so I heeded the dream and faced it forwards. The result was pretty impressive. But soon we had more than we'd bargained for. The sails must be hurriedly reefed in as the blow builds to a full gale. Our rotten mainmast was cracking under the pressure. And night and day, four crewmen must continually take the strain on the lee mainstay like human springs. She was taking so much water, we thought she might be breaking up underneath us too. No one could keep the cooking fire alight. But then by the second day, not many of us were interested in eating. Not exactly confidence inspiring was the sight of our most experienced helmsman, Lajan, bowing to Mecca at times not prescribed by the Islamic faith. By the dawn of the fifth day, the storm had abated. But none of us had a clue where we were. Somewhere out there lay the Spice Islands. Then from the masthead, a shout. Dead ahead lay a smoking volcano. Amazingly, we had zeroed in on the sole tiny cluster of islands at the centre of the Banda Sea. Early sailors told of from how far away they could catch the scent of paradise wafting from Banda. This was the scent which lured the West into the Age of Discovery. Christopher Columbus was looking for a shorter route to these very islands, the Spice Islands, when he stumbled on America. These were once the most sought-after islands in the world. For in Banda's unique volcanic conditions grew the gold of the spice trade. 
nutmeg. The fruit provides two spices, the nut itself and mace, the filmy red membrane which coats it. The bloodshed of centuries has left a legacy of graves from many nations. The Dutch were the victors and built an empire on their nutmeg monopoly. But now their fortresses are just haunted playgrounds. The British had once exchanged one of these islands for something in the New World called New Amsterdam, now better known as Manhattan Island. But today, Banda lies sleeping and forgotten as history flows past her. The first Westerners were the Portuguese, and their echo still lingers. In Banda's only church, the caretaker asked Lorne to translate a flagstone written in English. It unnerved me. John McLeod, a British midshipman, died here in the year 1800. He was exactly my age, to the month, and the same monsoon was blowing. Wallace had written that there are more species of fish in Banders Bay than in all the rivers, lakes and seas of Europe. But in these islands which gave the West so much wealth, I couldn't help feeling a certain unease. Earlier travellers had mentioned it too. The sense of some lingering unpaid debt here. I didn't know how close I was to come to paying my bit. I had no idea that this shy little octopus was a fully grown Moluccan blue ring with a poisonous bite that can kill you in minutes. I'll never know if it was the magic of the crying's dagger which protected me that day, or just my own dumb ignorance. But how easy it was becoming, in this sea of dreams, to believe in the supernatural and the long-suppressed fears of childhood. We sailed with the tide. Calmed, far off course in the empty quarter of the Banda Sea. For days there were no fish to take our hooks nor any wind to fill our sails. Was this the end of the West Monsoon? If so, we had never reached the islands of the Golden Bird. There was nothing to be done but protect the cracking decks from the equatorial sun and wait. was the first to go. In 
the arms of this deep and isolated sea, the sun's rays weave a hypnotic web, drawing me down to its center. But all boundaries and orientations are gone. There seems no bottom to this sea, perhaps no surface, and I'm afraid. The Sinar Surya is the nucleus of our universe, the only solid world we've got. It's a comfort to find our hull is the home of other marine creatures. Tiny crabs and fish, too agile to be caught. After days of eating just corn and salt, we're finally reduced to scraping the bottom. For barnacles to boil for soup. At last, a wind from the west, and we picked our way through uncharted reefs towards the Arafura Sea. Only 200 miles away lay the Aru Islands. Puffs of the languishing monsoon, we drifted into Dobu, her village capital. We have now left Asia behind us and crossed the line into Australasia, where Wallace had remarked on the extraordinary difference of the peoples and the creatures. The Kasuari, Australasia's answer to the ostrich. Its claws end up in the warehouses of Dobu, along with other costly delicacies and aphrodisiacs. Deer's antlers and shark's fins. Agaraga, a seaweed used in Western pharmaceuticals. Edible bird's nests and sea slugs, which Wallace had described as looking like burnt sausages rolled in the mud and tossed up the chimney. But this is the real treasure of Aru. Mother of Pearl from the golden-lipped oyster. But it has its price. Uncle Benny was a pearl diver, but he's racked by the bends, the crippling curse of his profession. He won't dive again, but he took us to the pearling reefs on the far side of the island. The equipment turned out to be more than 60 years old. This helmet was being used here in 1910 when Russell Wallace was still alive. We'd planned to try on their suits to film them down there. But the air pumps kept grinding to a halt and the divers had to be regularly jerked to the surface from 90 feet. We decided to stick with the old mask and fins routine. Despite my bursting lungs, I didn't envy them their leaden boots. They run a desperate slow motion race. Dragged behind the boat and buffeted by the currents, they must snatch whatever shells come within reach. If they lose their footing, they'll be dragged through the coral. Last year, three divers were lost on this reef alone. But we had come to Aru for something else. More than a century before us, Wallace had come this way, 
deep into the jungled interior, looking for the same thing. Cornelius had promised to help us find it, the bird with the golden tail. The first specimen to reach the west had had its legs removed, so it was assumed they never landed and must have come straight from heaven. They called it the bird of paradise. But in actual fact, it lives in what Wallace had described as the most horrible jungle he had ever been in. Cornelius has inherited the rights to this tree where every year the birds return for their mating dance. He told us to keep perfectly still and quiet. Not easy amongst Aru's notorious biting insects. Every fact I'd ever read about these birds seemed to fall away on actually seeing them. Long before the West even knew the paradise bird existed and gave it its name, the Eastern peoples had considered them as symbols of the soul and of immortal wisdom. For us, they had been the magnet which had drawn us across six seas since Singapore into another world. On the first breaths of the east monsoon, the Sinasuria weighed anchor. She left us, homeward bound with a new mast, her trophy of the great voyage, and laden with a cargo of salted venison, copra, and mother of pearl. We had come east. The adventure was just beginning.